We've come this morning to uh, the fifth week of our sermon series about toys and scripture. We've been learning through play and playing to learn. We've learned about Play-Doh and paint with water books and Pez dispensers and Mr. Potato Head. We've learned what it means to be molded by God, what it means to be baptized into the family. We've learned what it looks like to be a part of the body of Christ. And we've learned that we have been filled with God's love and sent out into the world to share that love. And finally, today we come to a new kind of toy, the first um, of this kind of toy, a board game. My family and I are big game players. We love to sit around the table and play any kind of game. Anytime more than two of us are together, we're probably playing a game of some sort. I remember um, my grandmother teaching me cards when I was little. I have this very vivid memory of her telling me she wouldn't play with me if I was going to cheat. And now I say that to my niece when she tries to cheat at games. My grandmother's the one who taught me solitaire and taught us how to play all of those kind of card games. And I remember um, my mom bringing home the game Ants in the Pants. Does anybody remember that game? Not very many people know it, so thank you. Uh, She brought it home from a Tupperware convention along with Don't Break the Ice. Anybody remember that one? Right? Good. Good 80s game that are now making a comeback. I have Don't Break the Ice for my children as well. So our game today is a favorite childhood one called Chutes and Ladders, where, as Matt said, the object of the game is to navigate your game piece according to um, the, the current game has a spinner. It used to be a dice, where you start from the bottom square and you finish at the top square, being helped or hindered along the way by ladders that help you climb or chutes that make you fall back. So the game is really a a simple race contest based on sheer luck. It's based on whatever it is that you roll or spin, but it's a pretty popular game. The Milton Bradley version of this game was based on one called Snakes and Ladders that actually came from an even earlier version of a game from India that was used to teach morality lessons, where a player's progression up the board represented a life journey complicated by virtues, the ladders, and vices, the snakes. The game made its way to England and then here to the U.S. in 1943. Now, if um, Matt, do you have the, the game board? Sorry, I should have asked for that before. This, uh, Frida Jeffers had this in her attic. This is the old school version of it. I think there's a newer game board. But so the, um, the current version of it has um, children who are um, like in a schoolyard. And you, I know you can't see it from all the way back there, but I'll just point it out to you. On the, on the ladders, they're doing really fun things. Like this one is helping a cat out of a tree, and then he climbs to the top and is holding the cat, and there's hearts. And then the chutes have um, mischievous things. This little girl is eating a whole box of chocolates, and then she falls down the chute at the end, and she looks like she's going to be sick. (laughs) So so it has um, children engaging in mischievous or foolish behavior, and then um, children doing good things that are able to climb. Now, I've got to tell you that as a kid, I never realized... Uh, that the board looked like that. I don't think I ever paid any attention to what the children on the board game were doing. It was just a game of luck, like sorry or other ones like that, that all depended on on what you rolled uh, when you rolled the dice. But I think, as the original designers intended, it actually is a really great metaphor for life, isn't it? There are times when we climb and climb and climb, and there are times when life circumstances or our own choices send us right back down to the very beginning. There are times when we're learning and growing, and there are times when we're falling behind and being set back. We all have them. The disciple Peter in our scripture lesson this morning I think is a great example of this. Peter's life of discipleship is always one step forward and two steps back. He has these great and wonderful moments, these amazing and holy encounters with Jesus where it seems like he of all the disciples is really getting it. And then in the very next moment he demonstrates with his words and actions that maybe he doesn't really get it at all. So let me just review for a minute the things that we know about Peter and what we can learn from him. We know that his name, his given name, the one his parents gave him, was Simon. We know that Jesus gives him the name Peter here in our scripture lesson, meaning rock, saying, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. What a compliment, right? We know that he made his home in Capernaum, a town in the Galilee region of Israel, and was a fisherman by trade. We know that he was married because Jesus heals his mother-in-law in in Capernaum, but we know nothing else about his family. 
We know that among the disciples, he seems to be the most vocal and almost kind of chief among them. Maybe it was his seemingly big personality that made that so. There's a Jewish historian named Josephus who tells us a lot uh, about what we know of the early church comes from him. And he tells us that Galileans, while being polite and chivalrous, were also given to temper and quarreling. He tells us that the Galileans were, for the most part, in favor of change from Roman rule and were always ready to follow those who held out the promise of insurrection. Now, while this is certainly some stereotyping on the part of Josephus, it does seem to hold true to the picture we get of Peter in Scripture. Simon was often quick to act or to react and was quite often wrong. But we also know that Jesus takes Peter into the inner circle because there are lots of times when he, among all of them, seems to be singled out alone or with a smaller group, given more leadership roles, more tasks, and more rewards. In this passage from Matthew, we see just a glimpse of the roller coaster ride that was Peter's walk of discipleship. In the first part of the passage, Simon Peter seems to really get it, right? Jesus is asking the whole group of the disciples, who do people say that I am? What are you hearing about me? And they answer, some say you are the prophets and some say Elijah. And then Jesus asks, but who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who names Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God. He answers right away, almost falling over himself to have the right answer. Like that kid at the front of the class who's like raising their arm like this, ready to, ready to answer all the time before the teacher has even asked the question. Peter, in one quick moment, with one short sentence, gives the first statement in our Christian creed. Who do we say Jesus is? The Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus rewards Peter with a compliment. He renames him, as we often see God do to other giants of faith, like Abraham and Jacob in the Old Testament in moments of great impact. And he says to him, on this rock I will build my church. A great moment, a holy moment for Peter. But as is often the case in life, it's one moment of elation followed by awful missteps in the next moment. Because in the very next moment, Jesus goes on to teach and show the disciples that he will be killed at the hands of the authorities. And it's Simon Peter, always ready with an answer, who impetuously blurts from the head of the class, No, Jesus, that can't happen. You must be wrong. You can't let that happen. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. Peter moves from the heights of recognition to the depths of rejection. As one writer puts it, in just two short sentences, Simon Peter goes from being the rock who proclaims the faith upon which this church stands to a stumbling block that Jesus once removed. Now, just like all of us, Peter doesn't make just one mistake. This certainly wouldn't be the last time that Peter said the wrong thing or asked the wrong question or got the point of Jesus' teaching wrong or neglected to do the thing that was right. For example, the day that he sees Jesus walking on the water and tries to walk out himself, he's doing really good in the beginning. I mean, certainly better than all of the other disciples who were still on the boat, right? But then he looks down and begins to sink so that Jesus has to come to his rescue. Or once when Jesus was talking about forgiveness, Peter asks him, how many times are you supposed to forgive any one person? Maybe seven times? And Jesus turns to him and says that after you'd forgiven him 70 times, you were just starting to warm up. Good guess, Peter, right? Or another time when Jesus is talking about heaven and Peter wants to know what sort of special deal people like he were going to get, people who'd left home and given everything up the way he'd given up everything to follow Jesus. Frederick Buchner, one of my favorite theologians, says in one of his books, Jesus took it easy on him that time because a rock can't help being a little thick sometimes. I love that description, right? He said Jesus tells him he's going to get plenty, and so would everybody else. There was no special deal for him above everyone else around him. And then you have the time Jesus was trying to teach a lesson about servant leadership by washing the disciples' feet. And Peter at first refuses to let his feet be washed. He tells Jesus, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus replies, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. And then Peter jumps all in. He says, okay, fine, then don't just wash my feet, but wash all of me. He seems to really get it then. Or the ultimate time, Peter goes from a high to a low. 
He is the only disciple, the only one who follows Jesus once he is arrested. He follows him to the court of the high priest, showing devotion that no one else does, even in the midst of fear, a high point. But then moments later, when asked if he is a disciple, a follower of Jesus, Peter denies, denies, and denies. How many times are we like Peter? We have moments when we feel the presence of God so intensely, when we are obedient to God's calling in our lives, when we use our gifts and resources to make disciples and share Jesus' love. But then we have moments that we fail, when maybe we act with the best of intentions, but our words and our deeds don't match up to the high standard set for a disciple of Jesus. Times when we miss the point or leave someone out or take our eyes off of Jesus' mission and instead worry about our own vision for what life should be like. Just like the game of shoots and ladders, we go up, 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 and then we fall, fall, fall. This game is about perseverance, the game of life. It's about outlasting. It's about going to the beginning and starting over each time. Now, in the game, there's not much learning going on, certainly, because it's really all about the luck of your spin. You can't do anything to make yourself do better. But in real life, the game of shoots and ladders is about learning a little more each time about what it truly looks like to be a kingdom builder, to be a disciple of Christ, to be God's hands and feet and heart in the world. It's about making mistakes and not beating ourselves up about them, but rather being willing to get up and try again. It's about letting each misstep be another journey towards the ultimate goal of being more and more and more like Jesus. And here's the thing. Jesus kind of tells us at the end of this passage from Matthew what that looks like. After Peter denies that Jesus will have to suffer and after Jesus rebukes him, Jesus then begins to really explain to them what it will mean, what it will look like to follow this one that they've named as the Messiah. The concluding verse of our lesson makes clear that following Jesus has everything to do with the two central motifs in Matthew's gospel. It has to do with saving or losing life, and that is the kind of life that has to do with welcoming and experiencing and bringing in the kingdom of God. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, Joseph's obedience called for a new appraisal, even a reversal of what it meant to be righteous. And Jesus continues that reversal all the way through the rest of the gospel of Matthew. He says that being righteous isn't about being the best at following the rules or making the most sacrifices or keeping the letter of the law. Being righteous really means caring for the sick and welcoming the left out, bringing the forgotten back into community. Being righteous has to do with being the least, not trying to be the greatest. Being righteous has to do with being a good neighbor and forgiving even our enemies. So Jesus, by calling the disciples to take up the cross, is not inviting the disciples then or now to start going around and looking for crosses to bear. The logic of the kingdom, he says, doesn't have to do with plotting our way to success. Instead, disciples are called to an obediently humble giving of self for the neighbor in which hearing and doing are brought into conformity, and in that the whole of the law is fulfilled. If you continue on into scripture, you see in the book of Acts that Peter finally seems to get all of this after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, sure, as a human, he still makes plenty of mistakes, but it's Peter, still the most vocal among the disciples, who is the one that emerges on the day of Pentecost to preach and proclaim what it means that Jesus has been resurrected. And it is Peter, still with intense experiences of the presence of God in his life, who ultimately urges and leads the rest of the apostles to opening the faith to the Gentiles when he heeds the vision that's given to him by God to put aside his notions of clean and unclean. Scripture doesn't tell us about what the end of Peter's life looked like, but it seems from the little bit that we know of early church history that the roller coaster ride continues for him. Perhaps the best known legend about Simon Peter details his death in Rome. It is said that he felt the danger that was beginning to happen again in Rome, and he decides to flee the city for his safety, arguing to himself that he would do much more good for, um, for the kingdom of God if his life were spared, if he were able to go out somewhere else and continue to spread the gospel. And so as legend goes, as he's leaving the city, he sees a vision of the resurrected Jesus entering the city, 
And he asks Jesus where he is going. I am going to be crucified, was the answer. You're going to be crucified again, asks Peter. Yes, Peter, I'm going to be crucified again. Simon Peter realizes that Jesus was going to Rome to bear the cross that he was fleeing. So the fisherman from Capernaum returns to Rome, and legend says he is killed there by crucifixion. The legend explains why Roman Catholics hold Peter in such high esteem. The Vatican is built on the site believed to be Simon Peter's grave, and no pope has ever taken the name Peter. That um, high honor is held only for the rock upon which the faith stands. Christians of every denomination, all of us, look upon Simon Peter and appreciate him and find in his life inspiration and hope. Because Peter was a man of action, even if it didn't always work out. He sometimes did and said the wrong things, and sometimes his actions, based on all good intentions, blew up in ways that were unexpected. But he is honored and remembered and revered because he acted. He's a symbol of hope because when he failed, it did not disqualify him. Friends, may we today be such men and women of action and holy love. And may we never become disheartened when we fall short or fail, but always continue to move forward with our eyes on Jesus and our hearts full of God's love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.